The Piper Written by Katie Belsey This is a story about a little girl. Her name was Henrietta Adelaide Rosenberg. But since everyone she knew called her Hetty, I shall as well. Hetty was four years old and very pale, with inky black hair and eyes the color of rainwater. She was good, quiet, and never got under Nanny Elsa's feet when she was tidying the nursery. She was everything a little girl ought to be. Hetty lived in a town called Hemelin on the river Wasser, in the northeast of Germany. Her parents were quite well known about town. Her father was an advisor to the mayor himself. But since they were so busy almost all of the time, she did not get to see him much. Her mother was a busy socialite, who never had the time for silly things like bedtime or stories. If Hetty ever tripped or woke from a nightmare, it was Nanny Elsa who soothed her frets and wiped her tears. While it did make Hetty sad sometimes not to see Mama or Papa as often as she would have liked, she would remind herself that she was a good girl and would instead play with her toys in the nursery or draw pictures with her best pencils or simply sit in the garden when the weather was fine and listen to the birds. There was a large maple tree under which she would settle herself on a blanket with two of her dolls and a china tea set. There was even a cat that prowled through the grass some days, chasing the butterflies and investigating under the bushes that lined the fences. She named him Heimrich, and he was often her only companion in the long summer afternoons when Nanny Elsa was cleaning inside and Mama and Papa were away on business. It was a cold, still night in late October when Hetty first heard the music. The bell in the village clock tower had long since struck midnight, but Hetty was not yet asleep, her large eyes staring out of the open window at the sky above hoping she might see a shooting star if she stayed awake long enough. At first, she thought the haunting melody to be simply a trick of the wind through the mountains. But as it grew louder, she realized that it was not. Clutching one of her dolls to her chest, she wriggled out of bed and padded in her nightgown to the sill of the window. She had to stand on her toy box to see clearly into the street below, lit by the moon like a silver coin hanging in the dark. At first, Hetty did not see him. His cloak was the color of the shadows and the moonlight and the patchwork of the cobbled street he walked upon. It was not until he was directly below Hattie's bedroom window that she saw him properly. He was taller than Papa, even taller than Ferdinand Bauer, who collected the apples from old Herr Reinhardt's orchard, and so thin she might have mistaken him for a cane. His hood was pulled low over his face, and both his hands were raised before him, as though he were playing some sort of instrument. She caught sight of a gleam of silver. A long, thin pipe was held between his fingers. It was from him that the mysterious music was playing. While it was certainly not a happy tune, there was an ethereal quality about it that intrigued little Hetty. She kept her eyes on him as she moved past the front gate until he was almost out of sight completely when suddenly he stopped just outside Herr and Frau Bockholz's house at number 68. There, he lowered his arms and slowly revolved to face the front of the house. She could still see no facial features beneath his hood, but Hetty got the impression that he was looking intently at the top window. 
He then lifted his arms, and that haunting melody drifted down the moonlight street back to Hetty. This time, she could almost hear words in the melancholy notes. Somehow, Hetty knew these words were not meant for her, but she felt a certain pull all the same, a strange urge to sneak downstairs and join the mysterious figure in the street below, to follow him wherever he would lead. An icy chill spread to the tips of Hetty's fingers, making her shiver. She suddenly felt deathly afraid and almost withdrew her gaze from between the curtains but for the strange, silvery glow that had appeared at the top window of the Buchholz's house. And she found herself unable to tear away. It was not until the silver shadow descended to the street below to stand beside the piper that Hedy could make out its features. Why, it was old Frau Buchholz herself. Her skin was no longer pink, but the purest of silver and her long hair floated about her like spider silk. She did not seem afraid of the piper, and seemed almost relieved to take his arm as he turned and began to walk slowly back up the street towards where Hetty was fearfully watching the strange spectacle. As the two figures passed beneath her window, Hetty saw the piper tilt his head slightly towards her house the darkness beneath his hood impenetrable, and yet she was certain he could see her, frozen at the window like the many dolls that she kept propped up on shelves around her bedroom. She could not retract her gaze until the two of them had walked, almost leisurely, as though on an afternoon stroll, down the entire length of the street, until even Frau Bokwurz's brilliant shine could no longer be spotted through the darkness. Hetty did not remember returning to her bed that night. Perhaps she fell asleep right at the window and was placed back beneath the blankets by Nanny Elsa. Her mind was full of the otherworldly events that she had witnessed just hours before she'd woken. Had it really happened? Could it have just been a dream? It had seemed so real, so vivid, and yet so entirely peculiar that it couldn't have possibly happened. She did not mention it to Nanny Elsa or her parents when she came down to breakfast. She doubted Mama and Papa would have listened anyway, and Nanny Elsa would probably just discard the thought as a lonely child's fancy. It was not until past the tenth hour that the doorbell rang and Nanny Elsa rushed to answer it. Hetty, who was drawing pictures at the kitchen tabletop, heard the excitable tones of Fräulein Everhardt, a notorious gossip, speak of a death in the town. Poor Frau Buckholz was now in the hands of God, having passed away some time the previous night. Oh, what a dreadful shame, Nancy Elsa lamented. She'd surely had many years ahead of her. Hetty froze, her pencil clutched in her tiny fist, her whole body a quiver. Could this explain the apparition she had witnessed? Could it have been the angel of death on his moonlit rounds, harvesting people's souls with the call of his silver pipe? It would be another three years until Hetty saw the piper again, but in that time she had never once forgotten him. If she closed her eyes and concentrated hard, she could even still hear the haunting melody he had played to call Frau Buchholz to him. It was three weeks after her seventh birthday that she found herself suddenly jerked from a peaceful slumber by what seemed like nothing at all. The night was starless and silent. Even the cats and crickets were robbed of their after-hours chorus. Hetty rose quietly and walked over to the window, 
pushing aside the gossamer curtain to clear her view to the street below. There he was, exactly as she'd remembered, tall, faceless, skeletally slender, his fingers as thin and deft as a spider's legs around the silver flute held almost lazily against his side. A thrill of fear rushed through her, and her heart began a countryman's jig against her ribs. She hid her face behind the curtain, exposing only her eye and a lock of long hair to the terrors of the night. She watched with fearful anticipation as the hooded piper preceded his somber march along the cobblestones. This time, he stopped only a short way from Hetty's house, just across the street at number 51. He paused, gazing up at the top left window, and slowly raised his hands to his lips. Hetty, who'd been expecting the haunting melody she'd heard those three years gone, was greatly surprised to hear a light, merry tune drift up to her window. It was the sort of song one might dance to at a gathering, warm and inviting. A glow spread through her chest at its sound. This time, it was through the front door that the eerie silver light emerged. This one was a lot smaller than when Hetty had witnessed poor Frau Buchholz's departure. With a shock, she realized that, this time, the piper had come for little Rosalind Applebaum, the daughter of the town magistrate, who had only just learned to walk on her tiny little feet. Hetty could see her little face alight with babyish eagerness and curiosity at the mysterious stranger waiting outside her front gate. The piper removed one hand from his flute and held it out towards the tiny girl in a gesture of invitation. Rosalind giggled and tottered down off the front step towards this new friend. Hetty wanted to cry out to her, warn her not to go. Her parents adored her. She would be missed. She was so very young. But all she could do was watch as the piper led the girl away up the street, her bare feet making no sound or mark upon the ground. Hetty's parents and beloved Nanny died the year she turned 14. A terrible storm of disease struck Hamelin as summer was rolling into the chill of autumn, leaving all but 300 men, women, and children alive. The city became a husk of its former sanctuary, and every night Hetty was woken by the dreadful sound of the piper making his ghostly rounds through the streets. One night, she even saw him leading a procession of thirteen phantom children past the church tower, their souls all taken from their beds at the orphanage. Well, Hetty could not pretend that she and her parents had ever been close. She wept nonetheless for the loss of her family, especially that of Nanny Elsa, the only grown-up who had ever shown her genuine love and interest. That night, the music was louder than before, creeping into every crevice and crack in the wooden frame of Hetty's house as it called its newest victims to the afterlife. The authorities did not yet know of the deaths of Herr Rosenberg and his wife, nor of Nanny Elsa, and Hetty was not quite yet ready to part from the house she had called home for more than a decade. She wondered for how long she could pretend that nothing was wrong, to simply shut herself away in this lonely house. The music grew to such a pitch that she felt forced to clamp her pillow over her head, her eyes screwed tight against the bright silver light now glowing through the gap beneath her bedroom door. She thought of how pleasant it must be to simply walk out of this life, as easily as through an open door. To leave behind the parents who'd never wanted her, the children who laughed at her games, the fear of when she would next hear the piper's call for some other poor, 
departed soul. Hetty kicked her blankets off with such enthusiasm that she sent it crumpling to the floor. The glow of her parents' spirits was fading now, reduced to naught but a faint light reflected from the street below onto the glass of her window pane. She ran as fast as her legs, still short for her age, could carry her down the stairs to the entrance corridor. The door was not locked, and she all but threw it open in a desperate attempt to reach the silver outline of Nanny Elsa, now joining the spectral parade that was slowly marching towards the mountains to the north of town. Hetty cried out for her, begged her to stop, but to no avail. For as she reached to touch the arm of her guardian, her fingers simply passed through like smoke. Nanny Elsa did not even turn to look at the child so desperately trying to pull her back to the mortal world. Hetty fought her way to the front of the procession, trying her hardest not to step through any of the silver figures. It felt wrong, somehow. The piper was some meters ahead, his melody a concoction of jigs, waltzes, and those ghostly words that beckoned. He did not seem to hear Hetty's pleas for him to stop, but she refused to give up. She tried to grab hold of his robed arm, but each time she drew nearer to him, something made her pull back. To touch him would be impossible. She begged for his mercy, for if he would not return her nanny to her, then to take her with them, wherever it was they were leaving for. It was not until they reached the foot of the Wesserbergland Mountains that the piper finally ceased his playing. He stood aside as one by one the ghostly figures stepped through the rock at the foot of the mountain. Hetty could only watch desperately in vain as both her parents, then Nanny Elsa, departed the world without so much as a backward glance at what they were leaving behind. As the last child stepped through into whatever afterlife awaited them, the piper turned his shrouded face to Hetty and spoke. Death may have an alluring melody, child, but now is not your time. The sickness passed with the wind. But it was a good many years before Hamelin became a town in which one might consider making a home. Hetty used some money her parents had put aside to run the family house, and began calling herself Henrietta again. But since we know her best as Hetty, I believe she may forgive us that request. She was growing into a beautiful young woman, and at seventeen years old, she received a proposal from a handsome young man named Klaus Zingsheim. He was not from high standing. His father owned a vegetable stall at the market, but Hetty found herself growing incredibly fond of him, and so she accepted his offer of marriage with gladness in her heart. They were wed within six months in the sight of God at the church, and it was not long before Hetty found herself full with child. For the first time in many years, she considered herself happy. That was, until the day came for her child to be born. A terrifying sea of blood announced the child's early arrival, and it was with great sorrow and pain in her heart that Hetty and Klaus buried their infant son in the graveyard of the church. That night, Hetty was already awake when the piper came, seated in a wicker chair in the front yard, a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. This time, she saw her baby boy, cradled in one arm of the piper himself, wrapped in the swaddling clothes in which he had been buried that day. For the second time, she implored, pleaded, begged, for the piper to return her lost loved one to her. When he did not reply, she instead demanded he take her life, for she no longer wished it for herself. But all he would say was, 
Now is not your time. Klaus wanted to move away from Hamelin after the burial, but Hetty, despite the painful memories, wished to stay. The house was her own, and she made a respectable name for herself within the town. Although they tried many times for another child, they could not conceive. Hetty often thought Klaus regretted requesting her for his wife, though he would deny this at every turn, of course. For many years, they lived alone in the Rosenberg house, filling that space their son had left with friends and music and as much merriment as Klaus could give his darling wife. While she loved him desperately and appreciated his attempts to give her the full and happy life she had so longed for as a child, Hetty often found herself walking, alone, up to the mountains to place her hands upon the unyielding stone, imagining she could almost hear the sound of laughter from some great beyond just out of her reach. Hetty and Klaus lived together for forty years, almost two lifetimes for some people of that time. The evening that Klaus left her, Hetty sat by his bedside and wept, his cold hand clasped in both of hers. Before night fell, she walked to the mountainside where she knew the piper would be talking to her husband, and again she would beg for him to take her with him. Now is not your time, he simply said. Filled with fury and despair, Hetty locked herself away in her chambers for many days, neither sleeping nor eating. In her mind, she concocted many schemes in which she might persuade the piper to take her into that world beyond the mountains. It was on the fourth day that the realization came to her, that, despite her grief, Klaus would never have wished for his death to cause such a wound in Hetty's spirit. He would wish for her to go on, to find a way, any way, to be happy. Hetty made her house into an orphanage, a place of happiness and merriment for the lost and lonely children of the town, as she had once been. She became a mother and a friend to all of them, and they became sons and daughters to her. That which she could never have had herself was now hers in handfuls. The joy it brought her filled her heart and soul with such light that she almost never thought of the piper and his dark melodies. The night was warm and soft, the moon a crescent of liquid silver in the sky, surrounded by the stars like a mother nursing her children. It was on that night, so many years ago, longer than you or I or anyone can remember, that the piper finally came for Henrietta Adelaide Rosenberg at the grand age of 85. His music floated through the air to her open bedroom window, and she woke as if from the most beautiful dream. The music was sweet and full of joy and made her feel light as swans down in both heart and body. Her body was aglow with the light of her soul as she stepped from the body that bound her to the mortar plane and stepped out into the night to join the piper. There were no other deaths that midnight, and it was in silence that Hetty and her piper walked the long road out of Hamelin to the place of the mountain through which she knew her sorrows would be rewarded. I bid you welcome to my kingdom, child the piper said, in his voice that was music and light, dark as the sky and clear as the moon. You who have walked with death and found death wanting, you who have brought joy from sadness and brought such joy to so many others. He stepped aside and with a soft smile on her lips, Hetty stepped through into the mountain. What she found there, even I cannot say. I can only hope she found happiness. Perhaps one day, 
when the piper comes playing his melody for you, you might ask her yourself.